thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my translation. And um, I have, I'm a person who wears more than one hat. Oops, that's not one of them. Um, not only am I a translator, but I'm also an educator and a writer. But today I want to talk about, thank you. I want to talk about the translation that I've been conducting, that I've been doing. Um, it's known as quite a difficult novel, and um, it's uh, quite long. I've already completed 399 pages, basically 400 pages of this novel. And uh, volume one came out uh, in January 2015, uh, 2016, and uh, volume two is almost finished. It took me 18 months to write it, to translate it. And the last remaining volumes, three and four, should take me another 24 months, I'm, I believe. So, um, I wanted to share my experience about translation, but I'm not necessarily going to talk about uh, technical issues. I'm going to talk about how this book involved a, a jump, a dive into the rabbit hole. And um, I'm also not necessarily going to talk about how much coffee I drank or how much sleep I lost when I was doing this. But it's basically about conquering uh, this book and achieving. Okay, so the book that we're talking about, which I'm holding in my hand, is called Finnegan's Wake. It's by the Irish writer James Joyce. And it took him 17 years to write this book. He wrote it between 1922 in 1930, 1939, and um, it's 628 pages. And it's experimental, which is a polite way of saying that it's a weird book, <laughs> that it contains a lot of uh, strange language. What makes this book unusual is that it is not written in an ordinary language. It's got its own language. It's full of wordplay, full of puns, and not only does he use puns, but he borrows words, really obscure words from hundreds of different languages, and they attack you, they, they're there all the time. And um, other than that, the grammar itself is strange. You're not likely to find an ordinary sentences in, in there. And um, since it's a novel, you're expecting a structure, you're expecting a story, and you're not likely to find one either. You're going to find um, a series of parodies, a series of suggestions, but a story may not really emerge. So, basically, uh, this is why it's known as an unreadable book. And if it's an unreadable book, at the same time, it's na uh, natural that it's, an, uh, it's also an untranslatable book. So you may be wondering, what's the fuss all about? What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to read you three sentences. So if you bear with me, I promise only three sentences. Okay, this is from um, volume two, which I've just finished translating. And here it goes. It may not or maybe a no concern of the Guinnesses, but that the fright of his light in tribal Valdusians hide the back in the doom of the walk of the death, but that the height of his life from the bright's eye stumping is when a man that means a mountain, bearing his distance, weighs a lymph, that plays the lazy winning she likes, yet that pride that bogs the party begs the glory of a wake when the scheme is like a room around the garden. All of these ease, with perhaps the prop of a prompt to them was now or never in Etheria Deserta, as in grander suburbia, with Finfan fauners, Rurik or Kospolit, for much or moment in dispute. <laughs> That's one sentence. Why for had they? It is Hibero Milesians, or Argo Norman, donated him birth of an ocean that was breeder to Sweto slaves, as mystery boulder forced in their waste, and as for Ibdulin, what of Himana, that their tooth tubular high fidelity dale dialer, as modern as tomorrow afternoon, and in appearance up to the minute, hearing that anybody in that rude duchy of Wallingston schemed to have the wrong type of date, 
equipped with super shielded umbrella antennas for distance getting and connected by the magnetic links of a Bellini Tosti coupling system with a vital tone speaker capable of capturing sky bodies, harbor craft emittances, key clippings, Vatican cleaners, due to woman formed mobile or man made static and bowling the whole <laughs> ham shack and wobble down in an aluminum sounds pound so as to serve him up a Melego Turney Merigon round, electrically filtered for all Irish earths and ohms. Three sentences. <laughs> okay, so at this point, uh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> right? Well, even before thinking about the translation, thinking about this, this monumental task, we're talking 628 pages. The question that I hear quite often that people ask me all the time is, uh, why did Joyce write this? Well, uh, I'm not Joyce, so I don't know. But I can make a pretty good guess. So if you've done your history, if you've done your homework in history, you know that the dates I mentioned between 1922 and 1939 coincide roughly to between the two world wars. So, in order to understand any piece of literature, uh, it may be helpful to look at the period, because it, it may explain it. And you must understand that the period I'm talking about is um, a period where millions of lives were lost, where whole countries, whole cities were devastated, where economies collapsed. It's the period of the Great Depression, so it's a period where mentality has changed, where people were trying to deal with that awful experience. But it's also a period where several interesting inventions took place. We have things like radio, things like radar, things like cinema, photography, sorry, <laughs> photography, etc. Can you still hear me? Okay. Uh, which are changing the way people perceive the world. But also, you will see that thanks to these changes and these social changes as well, there is a lot that's happening in the art scene. If you're familiar with the works of Picasso, if with the works of Henri Rousseau, Matisse, people like that are painting, and there is a lot of experimentation happening in the visual arts. So people are trying new things. A similar um, thing is also happening with writing. The novel, the theater play, the poet, the poetry rather, is no longer what it used to be. It's got other um, issues. So people are trying to find alternative ways of expression. And um, of course, Joyce is not the only writer who's experimenting with these forms. I can think of people like Gertrude Stein, uh, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, William Faulkner even, just to name a few who are writing in English, who are basically experimenting with um, experimental forms as well. Okay. Um, the second question that I get quite often is, well, how, how am I supposed to read this? Okay, if it's the way, I, I just read you a piece, how am I supposed to read this book? Well, the answer is really interesting because people say, how do I read this? How do I understand this? My answer is, don't try to understand it because you can't. I think Joyce was trying to be obscure on purpose. Instead of understanding it in the traditional sense, it may be interesting to, to study the musicality, maybe the poetic quality of it, because I think that's more important than the meaning. Because when you're watching, um, when you're listening to a piece of music, you don't necessarily try to understand it. You kind of get into it, it flows with you. And the same goes with a painting. If you're looking at a painting, it's not going to be, I'm trying to understand what's happening here. If you're looking at, at a Mark Rothko painting, it's a bunch of colors, right? It's not going to be about meaning. So I think that uh, that's one thing you can do. The other thing that you need to do is to approach the book with an open mind. And um, if this were a traditional novel, it would be bound by the traditional rules. For traditional narrations, there is the secret understanding, the secret agreement 
that exists between the writer and the reader. The reader wants the writer to tell him a story. The writer is going to tell a story. It's going to be about a, be about a particular person. This person is going to experience certain things, certain misfortunes. As a result of these, the person undergoes a kind of change. A kind of change, and that's what the reader wants. It's called catharsis, if you're familiar with the term. Supposedly, through what the um, reader is, is uh, through what the, the character is experiencing, the reader also experiences the same purification, at least in theory. Well, that doesn't happen here, so you need to keep an open mind. Instead, I think you need to try to do what I did. I mean, I did a bad performance a minute ago. Try to read it with an open mind, try to savor the words, try to see what they taste like. Because it's an issue of, um, of sound. Try to see how the, how the writer played with the words, how he distorted them. I mean, you weren't seeing the words, you were hearing them, but they're also visually interesting. And um, like I said, if you savor the, the words, you can, actually, you can actually enjoy the book. It contains several surprises for you, I think. And if you're academically inclined, if you're curious about what the hell is really going on in there, there's always guidebooks. There are several sources you can go to, which will give you um, a fairly good idea of where Joyce came up with all of that. So another question that I, that I hear quite often is, uh, how did you decide to translate this? And why bother if it's untranslatable why bother with the work? Well, those of you who were here this morning listened to uh, Nasuh Mahruki, and he was talking about how he climbed the Everest. And um, I was looking at what George Mallory, who is a famous British explorer and mountaineer, said before he died in 1924 sometime. They asked him, they said, why are you climbing the Everest? And his <laughs> answer was simple. He said, because it's there. So, of course, mind you, the note is that he actually died trying to, trying to do exactly that. So, my simple response is, well, the book is there, and I enjoy the challenge, so uh, why not? That's the short answer. The long answer is that we wanted to make the, the book available to Turkish, which is another world-class language. If the book's available in French, in German, in Italian, in Greek, in Portuguese, in Chinese, and even in Serbian. Why not have the book in Turkish? So I think that basically busts the myth, the myth rather, that the book is not translatable. So I will basically say, no, the book is translatable. At this point, I need to talk about the magic recipe, right? Because the question that I got is, how did you do it? Well, um, the magic recipe. I wanted to give you a recipe that you can take home with you today. Something that you can say, this is what Umar told us. Something neat, something elegant, something that works, something that's memorable, something that clicks. Well. Um, I happen to be a big science geek, and my inspiration comes from science fiction, from science, it comes from, it comes from the universe itself, and um, hence um, the equation that Drake proposes is a really good example of the kind of um, formula or recipe that I wanted to give you. Basically, Francis Drake wanted to calculate the number of civilizations out there which could possibly emit radio signals. It's a big unknown. So let me see if I can do this from my memory. The number N that you see there is the number of civilizations that can potentially emit radio signals that we can detect. You look at my cheat, cheat sheet. The R star is basically the rate of formation of those stars which are capable of supporting planets where life can exist. And Fp is the fraction of stars 
with planetary systems, and NE is number of planets with environments that are capable of supporting life. FL is the fraction of those planets where life actually appears. FI is the fraction of those where intelligent life appears. And um, FC is the fraction of civilizations which develop a technology which can emit radio signals which, which, which we can detect. And L is the duration of those signals. So basically, it's a beautiful formula. It's a beautiful, beautiful equation. It describes a complete unknown. If you had the right numbers, you could plug them in and actually come up with a number. Of course, we're not that lucky because uh, I don't have anything for you. I don't have a magic formula because such magic formulas don't exist. It's kind of sad. I should have brought my fried chicken recipe. That would be satisfying and fulfilling. Instead, I think when you're facing a, a task that's labeled difficult or impossible, you need to do an inventory. You need to look at what you have. You need to look in your toolbox, your bag of tricks, if you will. What's in there? Well, when I looked into my bag of tricks, this is my case, I found the first four things I found were worry, fear, anxiety, insecurity. So, you have all these little voices there. Oh my God, can I really do this? This is impossible. It's never been done be before. What are people going to think? Can I pull this off? What if it turns out to be terrible? What if they criticize me? What if I make a fool of myself? Is it worth it? Can I spare five years of my life, six years of my life doing this? Anyways, basically it's at this point that the magic of the rabbit hole that we're talking about exists. It's that unknown which you must face before you actually start any work, because this kind of a project requires you to jump into that rabbit hole almost blindly, without thinking about it, which is what Alice, Alice does in the first chapter. She dives in there without actually thinking about the consequences, without actually thinking about how she's going to, how she's going to walk out of it. The good thing is, we haven't finished with the contents of the bag. Okay? If you keep looking in your bag, you will find other things. This is my bag, so I'm going to tell you about what else I found in the bag. I found training in literature. I found linguistic training. I found very advanced computer and research skills that I've developed over the past 30 years. I also found a profound love for literature, for language, for translation, but I also like music, I like sounds, I like syllables, and I have a natural curiosity towards everything that is linguistics. Like I said, at the bottom of my bag, I found 30 years of experience translating very, very difficult texts of all topics. But also I found patience, motivation, and stamina. So I think that that's enough to counteract whatever negative voices were telling you in the beginning, whatever fears or anxieties you might have. Okay, um, more questions. What happens if you get stuck? Now, that is a scary thought. I'm a big guy, and I don't want to get stuck in a rabbit hole. <laughs> Can you imagine? The good news is the thing that's known as writer's block is just that. It's writer's block. It happens to writers, because writers have blank pages in front of them. They get stuck, they stare at a blank page. Translators are luckier. They are, they are staring at a finished text. They cannot get stuck. If as a translator you get stuck, and that happened to me all the time, the only thing that you do is you stop, you go to the next sentence, then you try to translate that one. You can always come back which I did several hundreds of times, several thousands of times, come back, double check, quadruple check, triple check, whatever. Um, another question that I heard quite often is, um, did you ever think about giving up? Well, um, no, the, I didn't, because 
When I was accepting this job, when I was trying to decide, I knew what I was getting into. I knew that it would take years. I thought it would take five years. It looks like it's going to take six, maybe longer. And I knew that failure or giving up was not an option. Uh, was not an option. I talked about uh, Mallory earlier, the guy who, um, who said that he wanted to climb the Everest because he was there. Well, he died trying to do it. They found, he died in 1924. They couldn't find his body for, for actually long decades. And um, also remember that Alice never wondered once. She was bored, like they said today. She was bored, she went down the rabbit hole, but never once did she wonder, how am I going to get out of here? And those of you who read the novel very recently know that her fall took quite some time. She didn't just jump and fall. It took her minutes and minutes to fall. And I was telling someone today, when I was much younger, maybe 10, maybe 12, I think that I wrote a story in which I was comparing Alice's fall to something that happens in a Jules Verne novel. I was mixing them up, so I'm quite familiar with that. But it's that fall that you must think about. I think that um, deep down, Uh, we go down the rabbit hole, but what we're trying to do as human beings most of the time is trying to deal with whatever chaos it is that we're given. It's always some kind of if effort to put some order into that chaos, to turn that chaos into something meaningful, and that's why we live. So the rabbit hole itself and the rabbit hole as a metaphor will be very useful as a discovery tool as an exploration tool, as a survey of what you're trying to do. But um, I must warn you, I think that the rabbit hole is only the beginning. It's only the preliminary work that you need to do in order to discover what, what you, you think you're going to do. Yes, it is dangerous, it is treacherous, it is unpredictable and possibly toxic. And we're talking about falling. What can be scarier than that? So to you I say, if you must, if you must fall, do it. But don't forget, that is an unstable and an uncertain state of mind. And nature has a way of balancing chaos. So chances are you're not going to stay in that falling motion for a long time. But um, what happens in reality is that after that, that's when the hard work comes you're gonna find that you need to work a lot to catch up with whatever it is that you're doing. So, um, I want to wish all of you success in your own uh, exploration down the rabbit hole. Thank you very much.